It's Friday, Friday, Friday. And that means it's time for a mailbag episode of Dirt to Dust. The one episode every week where we talk to you. Well, we don't really talk to you, but we at least answer your questions. And we, like, somehow talk to the, I don't know, the Ethereum, and that gets to your ears and to your eye sockets and stuff. So without further ado, it's the Friday Mailbag. Let's jump right in and answer some questions. When other people see dirt, you see glory and when you see a vehicle for the first time your first thought is not how pretty it is but how much abuse can it take this is dirt to dust presented by outlaw off-road if it's anything off-road and dirty we probably like it and we're probably talking about it you'll get industry info tech talk and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry let's do it this is dirt to to dust Dust. and now your hosts doug langford and caleb forbes all right so it is friday and that does mean it's a mailbag episode no special episode this week caleb uh i think we've got some questions um from what i was talking to you a little bit earlier before filming um, I think do we have how many do we have this week? How many do we, you already know? You already got that going? What do we got? Um it looks looks to me like we have two, but they're two pretty solid questions I think might take a minute to answer. I'm guessing they're rela- um, related questions and that's why we're okay. Yeah, um more so for like more performance based, I guess if I had to put each of them oh, in a Oh yeah, all right, performance. I like it. All right. Well, let's dive right in on this episode. Um What's the uh, what's the topic? Talk to me. So uh, the first one is from our absolute favorite Facebook group, the two liter turbo JL group. Uh, <laughs> I kind of think that group's boring. I the well, I like the Jeep Gladiators only group or whatever that, that one's got. It is yeah. so full of spam and fake accounts. Probably the worst group on the Internet. Yeah. Got to be the worst. Yeah, it's, it's pretty it's bad. terrible. Um. Two O Turbo is actually pretty good. It's been it's it's a little dry. It's less of a um, less of a funny group and and more of a serious, just like informative, dry. Well, it's Jeep uh, people that care dry. about fuel economy. I don't know. Like, come on. Y- yes, this is true. This is true. <laughs> I mean, um, so this one is: uh, Should I be using regular or premium gas for the two liter turbo? Manual says either, but for better performance, to go with premium. Oh. Is there really a difference? Uh, and I will say that um, mm-hmm. our our best friend at Jeep, Mr. Scott Bloom, uh, chimed in on this one a little bit. But I want to hear your opinion first. Uh, yeah, absolutely, it makes a difference. A hundred percent, it makes a difference. I get that the manual says that you can go with either, and I think most of that is um, no offense to the, the the Jeep people that write these manuals, but I'm pretty sure that's a marketing thing um, because they don't want people bitching about having a Wrangler that is required to run premium fuel i actually do think it should be a requirement 91 minimum 91 93 depending on your elevation um if i say 93 and you're listening to this out west you're gonna be like wait what 93 we don't have 93 um 93 here in north carolina is basically 91 at any kind of elevation so 91 plus uh and the reason for that is detonation i mean it's really just that simple so i think what people don't realize is the higher the octane number actually the harder it is to ignite the fuel air mixture and any internal combustion engine you're right that's what you're that's what you're blowing up you got a spark plug it's igniting a air and fuel mixture of a certain ratio you know 14 to 1 14.5 to 1 14.2 to 1 whatever um and that would be parts air would be the bigger number and then parts fuel obviously would be the smaller number and then as the piston comes up in the cylinder you're compressing that that air and that fuel mixture the, the fuel at that point is aerosolized. That's all a fuel injector does. We're giving it a little technical, which is probably why you had two questions today, because I can go for a few minutes on this. Fuel injector sprays it in. It's basically an aerosol. It's basically the same principle as uh, if you think of a can of Lysol, and in the can of Lysol, it's liquid. As soon as you hit the, it's out, and it's an aerosol. Same principle, because um, we can compress that. If we just put a liquid straight into the, com- to the combustion chamber, you, you, you're not going to be able to compress that. You can't compress water. Um, that's how you, you know, that's why people say when you put water in an intake, the loader locks up. You can't compress it and the force pushing 
that piston up can't compress it so it just bends the connecting rod breaks the connecting rod and carnage follows so the fuel injector aerosolizes the fuel the fuel goes in with the air the piston then comes up compresses it the spark and this is all very 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 meticulously timed like down to the millisecond and then the spark plug sparks off and all the spark plug is is there's a little it looks like this and this is the pad and you're just sending spark through the bottom here through the spark plug the spark jumps the gap which is a very very small gap um when the spark jumps that gap that pushes the piston down therefore pushing the piston up on the opposing cylinder that's why you don't see a lot of odd number cylinders you do see it the geo metro had a three cylinder uh, there's been a couple of five cylinders out there but generally speaking you're going to see four six eight ten and even some twelves um just because it's easier to do timing with the v opposing cylinders opposing cylinders you're never going to have a v5 you always had inline fives but you're always pushing down a piston is always pushing up another piston that's why we call timing so i say all of that to say you need that mixture precise and so we talk about compression ratios 10 to 1 12 to 1 13 to 1 13 to 1 is high but it'd be cool um we need a certain amount of of compression it is easier to reach a high compression number high compression generally more power if it's more compressed the boom is going to be more intense a more intense boom is a more is more horsepower that's basically it so are you going to get more horsepower not a ton but more horsepower premium versus not premium um that would be why that alone would be enough to say run the 91 the 20 is turbocharged if it wasn't turbocharged we weren't getting that extra performance out of the turbo. We weren't getting that extra recirculation of the exhaust air for the turbo. Then we would be running 87, 88. Wouldn't be a big deal or 85 if you're out West. But because of that and a couple other reasons, which I'm going to see if you want to get into those. Um, that was reason number one is just because of the turbo. I would say definitely 91. That's why you've got a lot of these people that are not running premium and they're complaining about the 2.0 sounding like a diesel engine with 20,000 miles you're getting detonation. It's that, that ignite, it is igniting too easy. Um, and again, we're talking about milliseconds here, absolute milliseconds of that shock wave going out from that spark plug, that shock wave hits the top of the piston and pushes it. These you know, spark plugs coming in here, you know, it's this way, the pistons up here. Um, so the spark is at the top. It's pushing with these, with that shock wave of the ignition, it's pushing the piston down. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, will it, will it run on 85, 87, all that? Sure. But I think it was more of a marketing thing. I think it was more of a marketing thing than anything else. And I would say in the 2.0, I would say to run the premium. Um, but before I go any further, what say you? Um, having had a, um, having had a 2.0, one of the first 2.0s in the past, actually. We both have them now, too. Um, we both have this engine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but having, yeah, I, I got my 2.0 in 2018, late 2018. So it was literally one of the first 2.0s to hit the market. And no one knew the longevity, long-term um, answer to that question. Um, I went off the manual. I was like, oh, cool. Well, I can use 87 or I can use 93. That's fine. Um, but I quickly realized within the first 10,000 miles, the 87 was causing some chatter, some, it just, it sounded bad. It, it, it already is not a great sounding engine. And it took it from that to sounding like you said, like a diesel engine, um, took it to dealership and they're like, well, what kind of gas are you putting in it? And I was like, uh, 87, like it says in the manual, they're like, no, 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 93. And, um, uh, so did that posted. I mean, I remember posting years ago and, uh, Scott actually said the same thing. He's like, no, go ahead and use 93. Um, He's like, unless you don't drive it like a turbo vehicle at all. He's like, if you if you get on it at all, use 93. I was like, okay, cool. So I did that, um, put some fuel cleaner in it, and it it stopped, it quietened down, and the performance was noticeable. The miles per gallon were, was negligible because I'm I was on 40s. Right. Um, but the performance was absolutely noticeable. And uh it, it, my main concern was the longevity of the engine. Um and being a turbo, like it's already prone to not last as long as you want it to um, because most people don't drive a turbo vehicle the way a turbo vehicle is meant to be driven. Floor pin. Um, having said that, um, <laughs> <laughs> I did not, I did not drive like a turbo. Got a floor pin that thing every once in a while, man. You've, You've got, got to. to, you've got to clean it out. Uh, otherwise carbon buildup happens and that turbo will stop 
working very well and you'll get cut off airflow and then you're kind of defeating the point of having a turbo. Um, but yeah, you get, you got to rev it up. It likes high RPMs every once in a while. You've got to let it cool down. So like when you park it, don't just immediately shut the engine off. You can just let it idle for, you know, just a minute, literally one minute, two minutes. And that's all it takes for it to cool down. Um, but that in conjunction with a, uh, with 93 octane definitely is, is what I would recommend for longevity, for performance. Um, cause I care about those things more than miles per gallon. Yeah, just put a turbo timer <laughs> on it. It's fine. You don't have to let it cool down. You did say one thing though that's ve- that was going to be one thing that I kind of led into was you put fuel cleaner in it and it was good. So here's the problem: if you are using the wrong octane of gas, you can actually get two problems. You can actually get two problems. Number one is you're going to get detonation. It's it's going to ignite too easy. That's called detonation or pre detonation, um, <clears throat> which is a kind of a precursor to knock. That's two different things. Um, pre detonation, you'll hear it, you'll feel it. It's not as detrimental to the engine. Um, but knock is bad. Knock is very bad because that is when you are actually pushing that piston down a little too early. And again, we're talking milliseconds here. Um, just that hair before that piston wants to go down. So before that connecting rod is made, it's full upward stroke and is ready to be pushed back down. When you do that and you're pushing down when it's just, just a little bit, that's knock. That's that's that dieseling sound. And you do that for long enough, you're going to cause problems. You're going to get main bearing issues. You're going to get connecting rod issues. You're going to get, you know, pin issue, shoulder issue, all that kind of stuff. That's bad. The long-term effect of that, you said carbon. Carbon is a byproduct, right? Gas is hydrocarbon. It, it, it's basically carbon. Fuel is basically hydrocarbons. That's what's in fuel. Olefins, diolefin. We can get technical and all that. Um, the olefins and the diolefins is like the waxy buildup. The black stuff that you can like kind of rub on the inside of a throttle body or stuff, that's hydrocarbons. Um, you're going to have some of that regard. Like it's just a byproduct of combustion, especially in a turbo, which is why you're putting some of that back through the engine. Um, so it's like a EGR valve, which stands for exhaust gas recirculation. Turbo is an EGR valve on freaking steroids. Um, so you're going to put carbon back through the engine. So when you step on it, you're increasing airflow, you're increasing compression, you're, in, you're doing all of these things and you're getting it higher rev. It's way faster. But here's the problem. If you don't do that, the problem is that you actually get that carbon buildup on top of the piston. Then that buildup gets so hot, it gets red hot. That red hot carbon on top of the piston can then ignite the fuel air mixture before the spark plug does. So now you've got one, you've got one shock wave coming from the, pre, the, the overheated carbon deposit on top of the piston. One shock wave coming from the spark plug. We just talked about it. That causes knock. That is bad. That is how you get. And, and the problem there then, then is, you know, you've, and you can do this one of two ways. You can run 87, run 87, and then um, that, that, can, that can cause that buildup. Or you can do this flip-flop crap. Well, I can afford it today, so I'm going to run the 91 or 93. And I'm giving two different numbers, West Coast, elevation versus not elevation. You generally are not going to go into the mountains in Colorado and find 93 out 10. You're just not going to find It's an elevation thing. So 93, where you and I are at, is 91 out you know, up at any kind of elevation, anything above two, 3000 feet um, is going to be 91 is the same. It's basically the same um, two to three octane points. So when you are, de- when you decide I'm going to run 87 and run 87 and run 87, and then you're like, Oh, I'm going to give my, I'm going to give the car a treat. She's going to get a little treat here and I'm going to give her some high octane. Well, it, don't work it like doesn't that. work like that <laughs> because you're, you're going to be like, well, why is the car run worse? Because now it's become such an octane junkie like it it, it's almost like now you're going to make it where it has to have the 91 because you've got the deposits but now the 91 is harder it's it's what it is but it's harder to ignite but now you've got all this freaking deposits so because it's actually taking a few more milliseconds to ignite the 91 93 like we want it to oh wait hold on that that deposits from all that 87 you put that's on top of the piston yeah that's actually igniting before your 91 93 and knock and that's bad so you have to run stuff like we used to. I used to be a big Chevron Tecron fan because they had the mo- none of these fuel companies will tell you how much the active ingredient is. Um, Chevron calls it Tecron. Um, I used to know the name for it back when I went to school for that stuff. Um, but there's an actually active ingredient that takes this this carbon and, and and breaks it down, so that when you're using a higher end or a better fuel injection cleaner, um, it you know it's going to work better. And you want to make sure you have a good one because it has to make it into the tank, diluted by other fuel, through the fuel lines, 
through the through the you know the spark plug, clean all that stuff out, and then actually make it with some sort of strength left into the combustion chamber. Um, some of these shops, I used to have a shop that did this. We would actually run fuel injection cleaners, and a lot of people thought it was snake oil because um, we'd run it into the intake. Um, sometimes we'd run it into an intake port. Sometimes, a lot of times, a lot of the kits you get, you actually take the vacuum line off the brake off the brake booster. <laughs> Because that is straight vacuum into the intake manifold. So you would come in, and it was basically the only way you could get all the carbon in both the intake manifold, the backs of the valves, the back, getting the in, getting carbon off the backs of the valves, super, super important. Because that valve is down in the combustion chamber, and you can actually get that, that, that gunk can actually soak up like a sponge. It can actually soak up some of that fuel as it comes from the back of that, because, you know, the valve comes down, you know, the the fuel shoots in through the injector, some of that fuel can actually get soaked into the valve. Well, then the valve closes and that fuel's gone. Fuel's back up in the intake mm -hmm. manifold on the back side of the valve. You don't have enough fuel to ignite, you get less power. So as you can clearly see, and we can, and I could, man, I, I see why you only did two questions now. Dude, I could go on this for hours, but you're starting to see why it's so important to run, um, especially in that Turbo 2.0. It's more, it's so important to run the premium. I get why Jeep did it. Yes, the engine will run. I'd have longevity. I'd have serious longevity concerns with running anything below 89. Anything with an 8 in front of it, I would have serious longevity concerns. Um, 91 and up would be my would be my 100% strong, strong, strong recommendation. For more reasons than that from a technical standpoint, but the stuff that you can kind of explain on a podcast you know, with finger puppets, right? That's <laughs> that's that's what I got. So, simple right, answer is right. know, just run the ninety one or ninety three again. Ninety one. However, on with the caveat that if you've been running eighty seven since day one, don't don't change it out without some serious maintenance. Well, here's what you can do: um, go and buy. I, I am a big proponent of Chevron Tecron, um, and I could get real technical, but Chevron the Tecron has a higher concentration of the active ingredient needed to break down hydrocarbons. So that's why I'm a Tecron fan. I know a lot of people don't, a lot of people know about Chevron. Everybody sees the STP in the marketing. Chevron legit has a lot of chemical in it. So I like it for that. So if you want to get your vehicle to stop being an octane, you know, reverse octane junkie, um, or where it won't sound like crap or detonate or whatever when you run 87, get a bottle of Tecron, throw it in there. Do that for, I would say two or three tanks. Um, and a bottle of Tecron is like 15 bucks. And I get that that's, you know, you're increasing your, your spend on fuel. I get that, but you're getting it cleaned out of all of the, you know, it's pay me now or pay me later. Right guys. Like it always is like you can run this 87 and spend less, but you're going to end up paying for it. Like either you're going to have to clean it or you have to do this. You're going to, you're going to have to do it. So I would do that. Um, nowadays, uh, I know Napa has these available and I know, O'Reilly's has these available. You can buy these fuel injection cleaning kits um, that I was talking about. Used to be that was a shop only thing. There are ones that you can buy over the counter now. I know Napa sells the Valvoline version, I think. O'Reilly sells a version. I'm sure Advance and Auto AutoZone does too, but it comes with all the little hoses and stuff that you need. If you are mechanically inclined, I highly, highly recommend that. Um, and don't worry when you see a lot of smoke out of your tailpipe. That's the burnt, un, that's the, the the hydrocarbons going. It reacts in the catalytic converter and makes smoke. Um, we we used to smoke some out at the shop so bad once or twice. I had the fire department called on us. Uh, it was <laughs> it was real smoky. Um, but you got to make sure you know yeah. if you got to be mechanically inclined to do that because you need to control the flow rate and all that. You don't want to overload cleaner because as we talked about earlier, there's only so much liquid that you can compress. Water being zero. Um, this is not really water, but if you put too much liquid in there at once, you can cause some mechanical issues. So be careful with that. That's just a way to clean a lot really fast and you can do it in 20 minutes and they cost, I don't know, 40 or 50 bucks over the counter. I think most shops that do it charge, uh, 120 to 150, something like that. Yeah. But that's usually because they have access to higher grade chemicals than you do over the shelf. So, yes, you're paying for some labor, but you're also paying for a little bit better chemical uh, because they are they are more trained on it or they should be. Um, that's not saying go to Jiffy Lube and get theirs. I know what those I know what a lot of those, you know, grease monkey type, chef, you know, Jiffy Lube places use. Um, you know, I, I am a big proponent of finding somewhere that sells like a BG products or uses like a Chevron Tecron 
the Valvoline one, the Valvoline kit is very, very good. Um, it's all about the level of the level of that chemical. That chemical is not, not cheap. So you could do it over three or four tanks of gas with like a bottle of Tecron, or you can go out this weekend and you can get that. But then once you do that, stay on the 91, you're going to be super happy. You will notice a difference in how the vehicle drives and how the engine sounds, especially on the 2.0 turbo. It's just, it's all good, no bad. I get it's a little more money to keep the fuel in it, um, but it's just, it's really what you should do. 100% it's what you should yeah, do. Yeah, I agree. And uh, just for um, just for the sake of answering at a, as a broad level, uh, 3.6, you're fine with 87, yeah, sure. 2 run premium. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a 3.92, absolutely run premium. Do not run anything else. <laughs> and that actually says that in the manual, premium only. Yeah, and the reason, guys, like you could go out and run premium if you wanted to in a lower compression four-cylinder. The problem with that is it's not made to run that high of octane, so the engine doesn't get really hot enough to burn off all that 91 or 93, and then you end up getting the same problem. The unburned fuel, because you weren't able to get high enough compression or get hot enough to burn it all, it's going to find, it's going to go somewhere and make deposits. So you're just wasting your money. You're not going to get any performance. You're not going to get any noticeable performance gains in a vehicle that's not designed to run it, so... That's why we have engines that are designed to run high octane and that you should run it. And then why there's really no point in running 93 in a four cylinder Toyota to sell. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Right. So there's yeah. that. So moving on from Short that question, um, long answer. Cause we've, we've <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, now that we've talked about intakes a little bit and uh, I've got a, I've got a wonderful intake question for you. Um, this oh, one actually comes from this, a Bronco. I know group. where this one's um, going. <laughs> And <laughs> because we've already uh, spoken uh, about fuel economy and everything else, going. Uh, Bronco Group will a fuel, will a cold air intake improve my fuel economy? Oh my god! Okay, that's not where I <laughs> I knew you were going cold air intake. I thought you were going to go the, the typical question of Am I going to get a lot of horsepower from my cold air intake? And the, I mean, the answer is the same. No, you're not going to get a bunch of horsepower from your cold air intake. And no, absolutely not. Are you going to see a fuel mileage increase? from your cold air intake. Like it's just not going to happen because one of two things is going to happen. Number one is you're going to get so much air that the PCM can't compensate for it. Like PCMs can learn to an extent and every vehicle is different. Every PCM is different. Every manufacturer is different. They can force X amount more fuel percentage over baseline, right? So 3%, 4%, 5%, whatever, based on the fuel trims that the oxygen sensors are reading post combustion. You know, the O2 sensors read what is the air coming out of the engine? What is the air? And they do they do this in two places, generally, upstream and downstream. The upstream just means it's before the catalytic converter. That one is reading, hey, what's coming out of the engine? What's the fuel? How much fuel is coming out? Am I, am, I, am I seeing more fuel, therefore running rich, and I need to lean it out? Or am I not seeing enough fuel, um, and I need to add more fuel? And then the PCM tells the fuel injectors, hey, add more, or hey, then that's fuel trim. Um, generally... Um, and this is all in millivolts. When you look at this on a scan tool, it's all in millivolts. We're looking for half a volt being perfect stoichiometry and then going up being being rich or going down being lean. The PCM can only accommodate but so much fluctuation. So if you're going to flow, let's say you're going to flow 25% more air with a cold air intake. Let's say 20. That's 25 is a little much. I don't. I know what they mark it. But let's say you're 20% you're over. You're not, the, the, there's not a PCM that's going to automatically be able to throw 20% more fuel because to actually see power, I have to not only see more air, I have to see more fuel because we need to run uh, the stoichiometric ratio, like the perfect fuel to air ratio is like 14.7 to 1, I think. It's 14.7 parts air to one part fuel. And, and I might be off a little bit if any of you guys, crazy engineers, whatever stoichi is, I think it's 14.7 to 1. That's like the perfect ratio. Well, the, the PCM is always trying to get that. It's never going to get it. It's impossible to get it and maintain it perfectly just because you're always on the you know, elevation changes, air temps change, air density changes, your throttle input changes, like that all changes. But it's always many, 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 many times a second. It's, it's trying to get stoichiometric ratio, that perfect fuel air ratio. And it does this as a waveform. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. Uh, and then the downstream O2 is, let's see what it is after the catalytic converter. That's just measuring the efficiency of the catalytic converter. It knows what's going in. It sees what's going out. Okay, is the, is the catalytic converter working? But that upstream O2 sensor is simply telling us whether or not the engine is running too lean or too rich or is it running okay. 
it's always going to be leaner rich in one way, but if it goes and pegs one way, it's going to max out and then it can throw. Generally, you're going to see either um, a system to lean bank one, system to lean bank two code or system to rich system. Yeah, you're not going to really see a system to rich with a cold air intake. You're going to see system to lean because it's acting like a vacuum leak and it's going, hey, I'm getting so much more air. I'm throwing as much fuel as I'm allowed to throw by the PCM and it's still not working. Maybe I got a vacuum leak. It doesn't know you put a, a, a freaking K&N on there. It doesn't know. Now, generally, you're not going to be able to throw enough air with a cold air intake to throw a system to lean code, which is like a PO171 uh, or a PO174 or the combination. One's bank one, one's bank two. If you have a four cylinder, you've only got one bank. Uh, but if you got a, v, a V6, V8, you got bank one, bank two uh, because of the V. Um, bank one, bank two. So if you're if you throw in more air and they can't throw more fuel, well, if I can't throw more fuel and I can't throw more spark, but I can't give it more fuel, but I, I'm, I just can't do it. But then I also can't dump, but so much air out of the back of the engine, right? Like I can take in all the air I want, but I'm limited on how much air can escape through the exhaust valve. And when you look at your exhaust, it's not, you can't say, well, I got a two and a half inch pipe versus a three. That has freaking nothing to do with it. <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. It is the size of the valves and how long those valves are open is how much exhaust escapes when that dead cylinder is pushed back up on the non-compression stroke for how much exhaust can be pushed out. There's a finite amount of air that can be pushed out. So you can suck in all the air you want. You know, it's the old suck, bang, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Yeah, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. <laughs> Google it. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe don't. It sounds don't inappropriate, but it's so. Be, be careful what order you put those Ooh. in. <laughs> and make sure you put all four in. <laughs> And we're talking oh, about a four-stroke engine, right? So the four strokes, that's yeah. the four parts. Suck is you suck in the air. Uh, squeeze is you compress it. Bang is obviously the spark plug ignites the fuel air mixture. And then blow is we're blowing out the exhaust. So suck, sque suck squeeze, bang, blow. Um, I think I had a T-shirt. Like, that was out. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, we're not getting into that. We're, we're not going to yeah, get into that. So, t -shirt to wear so if anything, if anything, having a cold air intake is going to decrease fuel economy because the PCM is going to read the increase fuel intake and it's going to add three, four, 5% fuel, whatever it's allowed to do to try to keep that, that stoichiometric fuel air ratio. Um, so that's why you'll see people talk about horsepower gains with air intake, which you will see a few. I, it's not really anything that's going to, especially in today's engines where they're already higher horsepower, a 10 horsepower gain on a 200 horsepower car is 5%. You're going to feel that. A 10 horsepower gain on something that's already got 300, 350 horsepower is not that much. You're not going to really feel that. So you're not really going to see horsepower gains until you say, okay, I'm going to do an intake and I'm going to do an exhaust so I can maximize what can come out of those injectors. But then you're also going to have to worry about, you're also going to have to mess with um, fuel delivery, like injectors, like you have to get bigger injectors. You're going to have to mess with a tune to program to actually deliver. So you're getting into a lot more stuff. Can you do it? Absolutely, you can do it. You can absolutely do those things. But just by doing a cold air, nah. No. No. Nah. Minimal power gains. Just the cold air. And no fuel economy yeah. increase. In fact, you'll get a fuel economy decrease. Yeah. And without without all the other supporting things, yeah. like a better exhaust, higher flowing exhaust, uh, tune, bigger injectors, all that good stuff, then, yeah, you're really just wasting your money. Um, it's more of a noisemaker than anything. It looks cool, sounds cool, and I guess it gives people the feeling of, "Hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a real enthusiast because I opened my hood and changed something out under the hood." And if yep. that makes you feel good, that makes you feel great. Um, otherwise, it's a placebo. Me, it, it's kind I think of, it's a it's placebo. Just, it's a placebo. I think so. I, I think that's what it is. I think, you know, don't do an intake and exhaust for performance. If you want an exhaust, do it because you want it to sound better. Um, if you're doing an intake, okay. If you want to do it, you want to spend that three, four, five, six hundred dollars, depending on what you're doing. <laughs> do it. I don't care. Just know what you're doing. Like know that you're not doing it. You're not going to go out to the drag strip and be like, dude, I'm about to get half a second, bro. No, nah. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to happen. You got, like you said, you got to do the supporting mods. Yeah. And to answer the question overall, um, those are more performance based, not fuel economy based. Mm -hmm. So definitely do not put a cold air intake to thinking you're going to get better fuel. The economy. only way you're going to get better fuel economy is to, um, drive easier that's it yeah lift up that right right bit. you're not going to tune that car that car was already tuned at the factory for maximum efficiency with with a little bit of a nod to performance they're, they're not tuning them for performance by and large unless you're buying 
a Pagani or a, you know, Kermit Seg or, you know, whatever, you know, then it's fuel economy be damned, but they are tuning them for fuel economy because they have to, they have to meet cafe standards or at least get as close as they can. Or they're getting big time fines. And we're talking six, seven figures here. Fines. We're not talking about here's a thousand dollar ticket. Stellantis. No, 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 no. <laughs> we're talking. There's a difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars if they're not meeting cafe standards. So, and it's about to get worse because I think they're not able to buy credits anymore, which is going to hurt Tesla. Um, so when that goes away, it's going to get even worse, which is why you're seeing now, oh, here comes a four by E to the, here comes the four by E two O hybrid to the gladiator. Oh, here comes a, now there's talk about a full electric. Like that's why you're seeing that stuff. It's not because Jeep wants to do that. Jeep knows they could sell a crap load of 392s. The problem is for every 392 they sell, they got to sell like six four by E's because of cafe standards. It's all about an average. So that's why the 392 went away because guess what? Next year, I think I think next year in 25, I think some standards change again. Uh, there's another thing coming. So unless that law changes of what's coming down the pipe, and you can research that, there's some kind of step. It has to be X by this year, X by this year, X by this year. They're coming. So unless your you know, illustrious government officials change that, we're kind of stuck with it, and every manufacturer's got to do it, not just – not just Ford with the Bronco and not just not just Jeep with the Wrangler or the Gladiator. It's, you know, it's government stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we'll say, though, um, just to offer a solution, if you are looking for better fuel economy, one of the easiest ways to do that is with a throttle programmer um, or throttle calibration. You can there are a couple out there that you can actually program um, a little bit more delay in the throttle response. So that slows down the sensitivity of, of your gas pedals. It makes it just, it makes it a, a little bit more sluggish. Yeah, to, but do the math, man, right? You got to do the math too. I mean, it does help fuel economy. You can feel it, right? Like the um, the old ultimate, the ultimate nine, the pedal commander. Uh, I think Banks has one for a couple of vehicles. Like you can definitely feel it. It makes the car suck to drive. I'm going to tell you right now. It's so unfun. Like you better be somebody who's trying to hyper mileage your vehicle. I mean, it just is what it is. Like, but at the end of the day, the, the Jeep, the vehicles, this was in a Bronco group. Same thing applies to Bronco Jeep. These vehicles are tuned to to hit all of the the mileage bullet points from the factory. You're not going without sacrificing some performance that you bought the vehicle for, you're not really gonna make it better. So, I mean, again, the only real noticeable way you're ever gonna get the best fuel economy is you. Your right foot how you drive, the amount of accessories you have. Did you lift it? Did you put bigger tires on it? Like everything you do to that vehicle, the way you drive and what you do to it's going to affect fuel economy. So, you know, if you just want max fuel economy, just keep the windows up. Never turn on the air conditioner. Never turn on your radio. I mean, that never use your lights. Like don't drive at night. Like all this stuff, you know, electrical loads are on alternator. Alternator is on the belt. The belt has a load on the crankshaft. That requires more fuel economy. Like it's all, it's all connected. It's like the bones in your body, man. Everything's connected. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, I tend to say, don't freaking worry about mileage mods because they're not a thing, especially on anything that's already not very aerodynamic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Bronco too, man. It's the same thing. Bronco, Gladiator, Forerun, like they're not aerodynamic vehicles. Like these aren't, the wind tunnel is not these vehicles, friend. <laughs> No. <laughs> just have fun people Look, if, you, if, you're, fun if you're worried about vehicles. fuel economy buy a vehicle specifically right. with high fuel economy 100%. if you want fun and, in, and if you want memories and adventures buy something to get you off the road and, and have some fun in it or if you're not worried about fuel economy at all just buy a 390 right okay and have all the fun <laughs> now i see i'm looking at the time on this episode now i see why you kept it at two questions but yeah, yeah, yeah. We are uh, we're out of time on this you one. Know how I go with the uh, but those stuff. were two phenomenal responses to those questions, which I knew they'd be a little bit longer responses, anyways. But um, I think that was pretty detailed. Because I'm a dork. Hopefully, uh, this gets to the right people that needs to hear the hear the. It's because I'm a nerd. I'm a total nerd for this stuff. That's okay. Well, we had on the episode right. like geometry and stuff. I'm a total nerd for this stuff, man. I don't, I don't know. Something clicks in my head. I'm not right. I'm not like yeah, just technically minded. I'm not like normal people. But at least I'm not as bad as Jeremy at rock crawler. <laughs> At least my brain is not like his brain is switched like different. I tell him all the time, like, I mean, he's he's full engineer. I still don't think he's watched the movie. I told him like so many times. I was like, dude, you're Russell Crowe from A Beautiful Mind. Like, that's how I think you see the world. (laughs) 
and he's he just looks yeah. at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, bro, I'm telling you what. I don't. I still don't think he's watched he the, movie. the movie. I still don't think he's watched the movie. <laughs> I asked him. At, I think I asked him at KOH yeah. or somewhere last time I saw him. I'll ask him again. I'm going to see him in Moab. Been a, what are we? What are we? Two weeks from Moab. Two weeks. Yeah. yeah, two weeks from right now. I'll be cruising into. I'll be waking up in Moab because they're two hours behind us. So yeah, two two, two weeks from now, I'll be waking up in Moab if, if we can finish the Jeep. The Jeep is almost done. It's back there. Like a couple hundred. <sighs> bro, I don't know, man. It'll it's tight. There. It is so tight. Like I pulled another tech off today. He's like, yeah, I'm going to do this today. I was like, Mm-mm, no, you're not. It was going to be something else for me, really. It was something else that didn't really need to be done. It wasn't a customer vehicle. I was like, no, you're not. I was like, you got four hours you were going to spend on this. Spend four hours and we got to finish this Jeep. Like we can't not have it done. There's no graphics on it yet. Like yeah. it's not, it's not even close. <laughs> It'll I literally there. dropped It'll off the bumpers there. this morning from Powder Coat. I dropped them off at the shop. I was like, all right, I'll be back in a few hours. I'll help out. I'll lay out wires. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Like, I'm here. Like, I will help you guys, whatever you need to do. We got to finish this freaking Jeep because just so you know, we're filming this. Today is Thursday. I know it's going to drop on Friday. So hopefully by the time this releases, uh, I'm in a better I'm in a better place on the Jeep. <laughs> but I don't know. Right. Well, I won't it's hold you up tight. anymore, yep. Doug. Go get your Jeep done. Get this thing ready for mob. We've got some. I gotta get out of here. Uh, but I don't want to leave. That, so. I don't want to leave without thanking everybody. We always got to thank the listeners. Absolutely. Um, I yep. don't thank myself. I do thank you for putting up with me and being the co-host here. And we always <laughs> thank the listeners and the watchers here. Um, please don't forget, guys. Please like, follow, comment, subscribe, all of that kind of stuff. You know, as you saw from the questions today, we do get those questions from you guys. We get those topics from you. We get them from the internet. So be active, you know, be vocal. Um, and again, as always, thank you wherever you're watching, however you find us. We certainly appreciate that uh, coming to watch us. Don't forget, next Wednesday we'll have our normal episode dropping as always. And, of course, next Friday, uh, any special episodes and or the mailbag. So that is where we will leave it today. Caleb, thanks for letting me go. I got to go work on the Jeep. <laughs> I got to go get this thing ready. <laughs> Hopefully by the time we do this next week, I can say that the Jeep's on a transport truck. So until then, mm -hmm. uh, we will say goodbye and we will see everyone on the next episode. You've been listening to the Dirt to Dust. Presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.